Okay, so let's say you decided I want to be my own person. I want to know God, and if I have to choose between God and people, I want to choose God. I want to evaluate the intrinsics of a thing, bad or good. Where do you go from here? Well, obviously you do those things. Every topic that comes up, and it's really annoying. What's good about it? What's bad about it? Maybe the first question ought to be, should I evaluate whether it's good or bad? How much analysis should I do? I mean, you know, if you've only got five minutes to eat breakfast, there's not a whole lot of analysis there you you have time to do. If you can do that analysis over and over and over again, you'll learn how to do it in five minutes while you're making the coffee. And then that is establishing a habit of analysis. So then that same habit you would be applying to other things. If while you're showering, you th- you're doing the plus and minus, pro and con. It gets to be a habit. It's like practicing piano. One of the other habits you have to constantly get into is am I sinning? And one thing, I ask God to remind me if I am sinning or if I haven't used 1 John 1 9 recently. Because it's really hard to tell the difference between a thought sin and a temptation. So I just use it even if I'm not sure if I've sinned. It's really hard to tell the difference between a temptation that's a thought and one that you actually gave into as a sin that the thought is there because the temptation was there and it just slipped by you so fast that you actually liked the thought. And even temptations feel good, so you can't go by feelings. That's very wearing on the brain. You get tired of doing that thought gymnastics. But it's essential to being an independent person. Every time I watch a movie, I'm analyzing it 16 ways to Christmas. People hate me for this. I have been told this my whole life. One guy I remember told me, he says, you know what, you think too much. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, he wanted to kiss and I wanted to talk. (laughs) That was 30 years ago. Um... People hate that, so you have to sort of be careful how much you do it around them. But God loves it. Now you can go overboard and overthink and read into things that, you know, analytical issues that aren't there. Some things really are cut and dried in life. You know, should I get regular or decaf? Well, do you need regular or do you need decaf? You know? You're looking at a menu. Which kind of food should you get? I go for highest nutrition. And damn everything else. But that's not always easy to tell either. You see? You get into the habit of analyzing everything. And of course if you express that to other people. They're going to get real nervous around you. People hate this. They really do. But think... That's how God is. He can't be omnipotent without having omniscience. And it's not omniscience if he doesn't know all the what-ifs. He knows them all already. He know, get, get this real point, real, because this is a key to his personality. He knows everything already. He knows the stuff that wouldn't exist, that he could make exist. He knows what could exist, what can't exist, what might exist, and all the ramifications. And all how everything would change if one dot changed. How does he enjoy being God? We blithely say things about God that we don't even think about what it's like for him to actually be that way. Being omnipotent. Having all that... Now, aren't you tired listening to my many videos? I'm tired making them. I talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and at the end, I'm exhausted. I don't know about you. Don't you get tired of hearing so many words? But just think, all those words have always been in God's head from eternity past. 
Why wouldn't he be tired to know all that? Why wouldn't that be tiring and annoying? Knowledge is a weight. That's why, you know, it's important to understand how Christ paid for sins. He was imputed with the knowledge of the sins. That's what it says in Isaiah 53, 11. Also 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin, sin was made. That's the literal order of the Greek. No, no, wait a minute. He, Father, made him, Son, who knew no sin, comma, in English, sin. That's the literal Greek order. Shocked me when I first saw it. He who knew no sin was made sin. Which means he knows it. Isn't that horrible? God has all the knowledge of sin. All the knowledge of all the horror. Everything that's ever happened. Or will happen. All the horror. All of hell. God knows it better than anybody else. Even those who are going to be in hell. They only know their little narrow dot perception of it he knows it all and it's always been there why doesn't he hate being God he must like therefore what he knows So he must like the analytical paths of making good on everything. Because he could have created truth to be something else. He could have made us all Stepford wives and there would be no sin. And there would be no suffering and no pain and no nothing. Why didn't he do that? You see what I'm getting at here? I'm asking analytical questions. If you want to know something about something or someone, you ask those questions. You ask why. You ask what. There are a whole bunch of people out there that can tell you all kinds of football facts. Doesn't mean they understand football. They think they're important and smart because they know those facts. And for a lot of guys, not just guys either, they enjoy knowing those facts. They enjoy it. They enjoy the game. They enjoy analyzing the game. My, my pastor was a real big football guy. He enjoyed it. He studied all kinds of football facts because to him football meant something about life, which it does. Football, soccer, all the body contact sports. I happen to enjoy racquetball, so when I first started learning, I learned everything I could about it. And I would be boring to somebody who doesn't like racquetball. You getting that? Somebody who doesn't like Bible doesn't like you studying it. Somebody who doesn't like Bible doesn't like all the anal analysis that's required to actually know Bible. Some women can go on and on and on about fashion and I want to throw up. Or flowers. I'm not very female in terms of my tastes. They go on and on about their children. I just can't identify with any of that. I, I, it's, it's like God gave me a male brain and I had a female body. But I'm heterosexual, thank you very much. But, you know, I mean, if somebody's talking to you about something you're not interested in, you don't want to be analytical about it. If you're interested in a subject, subject, you start being analytical about it. And you gradually learn not to talk about it so much around people who are not interested. God's interested in everything to that level. 
he is totally interested in absolutely everything. So, he's interested in hearing you think out things. That pleases him. You could have, and Paul, Paul was explaining this in 1 Corinthians 13, if I know absolutely everything, but I don't have love, and love there actually means the Bible content of the Bible in your head, because Christ is the head, okay, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Very clever wordplay there. If you don't have love, then it doesn't matter what you know. Okay, now let's bifurcate that a little bit. If you have the whole Bible memorized, but you don't love the content, then what good is it? And you don't love the content just because you can cite it or because you memorized it. You don't love the content until you can analyze it 16 ways to Christmas and you enjoy that process. And that's just the content. That's just one side of it. The other side is living out the content. And that's always glitchy because the body doesn't want to go along to start with. And there's always some question mark. There are always these imponderables and gray areas. And of course, execution is always bad because it's like practicing piano. It's very tiring. And so we quit. Or we give in to sin. That's the second side of the spiritual life. It's two sides. You got to know it. And that takes years. And you got to do it. And that takes years. 90% of Christians, 90% of humanity for that matter, is all into doing, but they're not into knowing. Therefore, what they do is do-do. If you don't know something, and you just settle for some little 12-step program or paint by numbers, you don't know the subject. That's the way academia is. They're full of facts and almost no good analysis. That's what people in every field of business are. They just go along with whatever it takes to get along and they do, 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 and it's all surface and they have no real understanding of the topics. This is especially true when it comes to computers. Incompetence is everywhere. Why? Because we're all doing shallow. And we don't really know what we're doing. So, assuming that you've decided that what you want to do is actually know God and actually know the Bible, then that means you're going to be spending a lot of time analyzing. And the point of this audio is to tell you what lies ahead once you do. It's very hard for me to live with. It's true not only with respect to Bible, but anything else. The more you get into a topic, the more you study it, the more you analyze it, the more you gain skill in actually knowing what the topic is, and the more you gain, and this is the sad part, you gain discernment in realizing how shoddy is the understanding of the bulk of humanity on that topic. The hardest thing about learning Bible or anything else is that you realize that the great, how do you want to call it, the people who are celebrated in the field, whatever field it is, they don't really know anything about it. They're herd bound. Pick your own field. The more you know about your field, really know, not just have a bunch of facts at your command. Not just be able to cite who are the important people in it or the history even. Do you really know the field? Do you understand it? The heart of it? So that you can independently think it. That's when you become competent in knowledge. Not necessarily in action, but in knowledge. And that's, once you get there, the big problem, the big... 
how do you want to call it, the big depression, is that you'll realize that most people that are in your field don't know what they're doing. That is absolutely true of Christian life. That is absolutely true of spiritual maturation. The really sad thing about coming to know God and coming to know the Bible, and that's all you're doing is the no part. The do part is, all, is, you know, way behind the no part. The no has to lead the do. You have to know in order to do. In the Old Testament, that you, you did things in order to learn things. It's the reverse in the New Testament because Christ won at the cross. Now we have to know before we can do. So the, the doing is always less competent. But as you get the knowledge, you become almost too depressed to do anything. Because you realize how low the knowledge is in Christianity. Christian theology is basically five-year-old. What a five-year-old knows. In other words, if you were to compare the state of Christian theology to the to uh, human life, you got your five-year-old in kindergarten. The knowledge level that a five-year-old in kindergarten has about even academic subjects, that's about where Christian theology is. They still are arguing over whether God is one or three. They're still arguing over what constitutes Christian behavior. They're still focused on morality. And for them, morality is behavioral. They don't even know how to think about it. They don't understand that morality is just something for the human race to, you know, benefit the human race so we all can get along with each other. It's limited in its value. It's not spirituality at all. You know, you and I are neighbors, so I'm not going to steal from you, and you're not going to steal from me, because we're neighbors. We have to get along. I'm going to be quiet and turn my stereo down, and so will you. I'm going to smile at you when I went into you when we both walk out the door to our cars. We're just in, that, that's innate morality. That's so that we can have a pleasant relationship with each other. Okay, but Christian theology mistakes that as spirituality. If I'm nice to you and you're nice to me, then I'm a good Christian. And if I'm not nice to you, I'm not a good Christian. They don't have the slightest idea what Christ said. He was not nice. God is not nice in the Bible. He sometimes says nice things. But uh, you'll never find a a sentence or a paragraph in the Bible where it's only nice. He always goes from one side to the other. Nasty, then nice. Nasty, then nice. This is especially true in all the prophecies. Cross before crown is the basic format. So you're going to learn, and that's the whole point of this audio, and I'll try to keep it short. Once you get into the spiritual life and you start growing in it, the number one thing that's going to hit you is you're going to realize how low Christians are. And it's going to be really hard to live with that. I'm not over it yet. It's my, it's, it's a major, um, obstacle in the spiritual life. It's somewhat analogous to when you're a kid and you start to, you know, sometime in your teens, although it can happen earlier, you start to realize your parents aren't perfect. You start to realize that your parents have significant flaws that they have significant limitations. That they are, what do you want to call it? That the pedestal that they were on in your mind for so long should have never been there. 
You know, we all tend to idealize our parents, our teachers, people who are a lot older than us, people who are in fields that we don't know anything about, people with initials after their names, and that, that helps. That's part of morality, too. It helps to value somebody farther ahead than you by whatever standard age, authority. It's helpful to regard them as being better. Because in certain ways they are. Okay, but they're still human. And as you age and you start to know something about the same subjects, you realize that these so-called, you know, betters aren't better. What do you do? And what happens when you become the expert, more expert than them? What happens when your parents start to, I don't want to put, put it, you get to an age yourself where you start to see your parents on a more equal footing and you learn things about what the way they are that you didn't see when you were younger and they themselves are having trouble with the fact that you're older now too. Some of them are relieved to be able to relate to you as an adult for a change. But for a lot of parents, they can't get past that. A lot of parents can't handle the fact that their kids are grown up and they keep wanting to assert their parent. I'm your mother. I'm your father. You should do what I say. That's because they're starting to feel like threatened. Because they're human too. They're used to having authority over you for so long that now that that's changing... They can't deal with the change. Well, the same thing is true for the so-called authorities and experts. They have an office, they have a reputation, they have a position, but that doesn't mean they know what they're doing. How do you deal with that? And above all, how do you deal with the fact that in human affairs whether it's about the spiritual life with Christians or anything else, your average Joe Blow is clueless. Because, like I said in the last increment, we all start out childish, we all start out living on hearsay, we all start out ignorant, and we are therefore arrogant to the extent that we repeat what others have told us without having personal knowledge of it ourselves. We start out clueless, and you can, you know, that's okay. Okay, but most of us remain clueless by choice. We don't pay attention to our spelling or our grammar or the coherence of the thoughts that we express. We repeat what others say because that makes us fit in. And the real hardship of all this is that we're not children anymore. We're adults. But in our heads, we're still kids. And we don't like it when somebody else knows more than we do. And we don't like it when somebody demonstrates, in, you know, intentionally or not, that we're wrong or that they know more about something than we do. Because it exposes the fact that we're still kids. See, I'm an adult now. I'm in, I'm all grown up now. Yeah, until somebody else comes along and shows you what a child you are. And, and they don't necessarily even mean to show you up. They're not trying to do that. But the superiority is clear. And you're aware of that. And it's like, oh, should I get upset with this person? And a whole lot of people do. Childish people are like that. They're jealous. They're petty. They're vindictive. And that's how Christians are. So the hard part about this war is that, first of all, you're warring against yourself and your own desire, which is native to humanity, 
to being childish and ignorant and arrogant because, gee, you know, I just want to feel good. So you're first warning on the inside. And it's a super war to, to want to learn God because, you know, Christian teaching is so boring, it's not funny. Teaching on any topic is so boring, it's not funny. I don't know how any of us learned anything in grammar school and high school because of the way it's taught. I mean, every one of us probably had one teacher in our whole 12 years of school that we can point at and say, boy, I really love that teacher. And why? Because the teacher was interested in the topic and taught it well. But your average school class, you probably don't remember anything you learned in school. Yeah, because it was like, oh, I just got to study this in order to pass the test. And that's how we think about Bible, too. So, as a result, you got a whole bunch of ignorant people who are jealous of those who are not ignorant. And that's the outside war that you face every single day. And the hardship of this is that you know. That's how it is. Here you are, one in gotta be a million Christians who understands the issues better than they do and you can't even discuss it with them. They will resent you knowing more. They will know that you know more. They will need to attack you. That's what Christ said when he said mother against daughter over me. There is no such thing as Christian unity. This all, the whole thing is one great big war and competition. Not because you necessarily want it that way, or I do, or they do. It's because of these differentials. It's because the bulk of humanity wants to be childish and ignorant and feel good and pontificate and fit in and live on hearsay. And if you don't, So you got the war within, and you got the war without, on, on a daily basis. Even in a time of prosperity and peace. As if that weren't bad enough. You've got this weight of the knowledge on you, the weight of constantly warring with yourself in, in, in order to, to, to learn God better and deal with people, blah, blah, blah. It's the weight itself in addition to the struggle. Just the weight of knowing this all the time. Okay, and here's another weight that adds to it, and this is really hard to accept. You're learning and living on Bible, as I've said many times now, is what carries world history. My pastor spent 50 years teaching that. He called us spiritual atlases. Every day you learn and live on Bible, whether you're doing your email or figuring out what to eat for breakfast. You're in a very, you're in a very rare group. Not even 1% of Christians are even doing that kind of analysis on a daily basis. And the world depends, the wealth and the health and the time of the world depends on you doing that. And who are you doing it for? For people who don't care. They're living because you're doing that. They get one more day because you're doing that. That's the terms of the trial. They have one more day because you're doing it. It's a Sodom and Gomorrah principle. You know, when Abraham said to God, well, if there were ten righteous in the city, will you still destroy it? And the Lord said, no, not for ten. You see what I'm getting at? And that was a pentopolis, and it had to be, I don't know, it was a minimum of 100,000. My pastor tried to figure out the ratio. But, you know, the population densities were a lot greater in the old days. So, maybe it's more like a million. I don't know. It depends on how much, you know, how things were working then. 
But let's say 100,000. 10 out of 100,000. When he said righteous, he meant believers. He wasn't saying spiritually mature. Righteous just means that you, it's, you know, Genesis 15, 6, you have the righteousness of God counted to you. There weren't even 10 believers in that Pentopolis. It was Lot and his wife and the two daughters. And they got pulled out. That's the pattern in history. And there are too few positive. Then all the negative get destroyed. Same pattern as the flood. And the positive get pulled out of the danger. That's what the end of Hebrews 10 is talking about. Because they were expecting the destruction of the temple. That's why the book came out. 68 AD. You know, it says, you know, we won't shrink back to destruction. It's not talking about loss of salvation. That's what, you know, kindergarten Christianity thinks that passage means. That's not what he's talking about. Okay? So here you are doing something boring and annoying, and you want to do it because you want to get closer to God anyhow. But that's buying time for all these clueless people who are going to remain clueless. Until there aren't even ten righteous left. And of course, that's the criterion for the rapture. God isn't going to end church age unless there's nobody else who's going to believe or grow. That means the growth stops and, you know, People stop believing in the gospel. That's the that's what happens. It's just that there's a, the timing of it is such that the body is actually complete. Then it's a, it's the two factors. The body is completed, and you know what? Continuing church aid one more minute, nobody's going to get saved, and nobody's going to grow. Which means that the Christians that are going to be there in that very last generation are negative. so negative that the gospel's not even going out and nobody's believing in it. So how many Christians are going to be left at that point? Well, who knows? Doesn't sound like too many. Could be a lot and they're all negative. Well, what's the difference between then and now? The Bible tells us it's the same. Every generation could be the rapture generation, which means every generation is negative. That's why I spent so much time in the GGS playlist showing how Paul plots out what if the rapture dates. And by the time he gets to Constantine's death, which is the syllable proel, in proel picotas, of Ephesians 1.12, which is 337 AD, Paul's saying the few. And what's really bizarre about that particular passage is that Constantine died on Pentecost, and proel picotas means first fruits. He didn't even finish the word. So Constantine died of failure. It's really horrible sarcasm. I mean, horrible meaning. Clever sarcasm that Paul is using. And he, he did that with other Roman emperors, as I had already shown in the series. Constantine died a spiritual failure. It's proel, not even proel picota. So he's not one of the first fruits. And then... Paul knows that he's going to die on Pentecost. You know, Paul could have reordered the wording in Ephesians 1. He could have ordered it in many, you know, reworded it in different ways, and the meaning would be the same to us in translation. But he, he tagged his words for the order. And why am I telling you that? Because it's going to become frustrating. It's supremely frustrating. A, to have to be fighting the battle inside, fighting the battle outside with people. The sheer weight of knowing that that's how it is. And the sheer weight of knowing that everything depends on you. And here these clueless people are out there. Counting themselves moral. Yeah, And how immoral is it that they don't even bother to learn the Hebrew and Greek? I'm sorry. These are the actual words that Moses wrote. These are the actual words that Christ spoke. And you don't want to know what they are? We can't even get his birthday and death day right. 
Christianity is so puerile and incompetent in its theology. I mean, you know, if you don't remember somebody's birthday or death day, that means you're not interested in them. We humans are real big on facts that are, generally speaking, irrelevant. So it's always born. Well, this is my birthday, and you didn't remember my birthday? Yeah, we don't ever remember Christ's birthday. Bible's real plain. It was a Hanukkah 4 BC. Yeah. And scholars don't know that. Christ died on Passover 30 AD. Bible's real clear on that. It was a Wednesday that year. That's how clear the Bible is. Yeah, and we don't know that either. Humans are clueless. They want to be clueless. They will remain clueless, and they resent anybody who's not clueless. And you still have to fight for them? This is roughly analogous, honey, to the troops of whatever your home country is sitting out there in their, their outpost or where they're training. And you know what? No matter what government it is, U.S. or any other government, the troops never get enough support from the civilians. They're always looked down on. They're always getting the, a lower quality of food. They're getting a lower quality of pay. They're getting a lower quality of benefit. And their lives are on the line. Same is true for the police departments of the world. The people who defend us against what's bad are treated the worst everywhere in the world. It's always been that way from time immemorial. Well, the Christian who's growing in Christ is treated the worst by his fellow Christians. They resent him. And you're going to be spending your time this way and they're breathing because you're doing this and I'm not even talking yet about the unbelievers and they're universally hostile to us whether they call themselves atheists or they say they believe in some other version of God it's still the same thing you're buying them time so they can wake up and smell the coffee and they won't wake up and smell the coffee that's why physical war in the world occurs because they don't wake up then in order to prevent the contagion, the, it's, it's analogous to the fourth generation curse, the same idea, then God has to clean house. And so he lets war happen. There's cursing by association and blessing by association. It's all spelled out in Deuteronomy 26 and um, Leviticus 26 first. Deuteronomy is a, a restatement. And you're really a soldier on the front lines getting no respect for what you're doing. And all those clueless people living their clueless lives are going to keep on living their clueless lives thinking they're doing great things for God and they're not doing squat. Well, what was it when Christ was down here? We all sit here and praise him now, but honey, had we been there at the time he was here, we'd have gone along with the crowd. We'd have said the same thing that the Jews said about him. So that's the war. It's a tripartite war. You're warring inside with yourself. You're warring outside with the people who don't want to be analytical about the Bible and actually learn it like you do. And that war is, you know, like a cold war. It's very simmering below the surface. There's a whole lot of tension in all the relationships. And really, you're just better off not saying very much about God unless called upon to do so, which is the right way it's supposed to work, actually. The Greek word is martoreo, and it means that you're answering in a witness box to a question somebody puts to you. And it's like you're under oath and whatever you say, you're liable for. And that's what Greek word martyreo, usually translated witness, really means. It's not knocking on doors. Oh, I'm sharing the gospel. 
When people knock on my doors to share the gospel, I won't open the door to them. They don't have they don't know what witness is. So they sure don't know, know the gospel correctly. You see the point? They're clueless. So I'm worrying with them. Well, but you have thousands of those wars every day. It gets real tiring. It gets real easy to give in. It gets real easy to quit. And then it, it, to add insult to injury, here you are on the front lines. If you're learning and living on Bible and God's system, you're on the front lines. You know, the front lines are kind of deep because the mature are out in front of you. Anybody who's more mature than you is ahead of you, okay? But you're actually in the game. Whereas all these other Christians, 99.9% .9 of Christianity, they're not even in the game. And they resent the fact that you are, even if they don't know. Because they don't want to go the way you're going. And you have to live with knowing that. All the time. Now why did I bring all this up? This is exactly the pattern of the kind of knowledge and lifestyle Jesus Christ had when he was down here. See, remember I said everything's at God's level? You're living at God's level. It doesn't mean you're living in God the same scope, not the same quality, but it is the same type. That's one thing my pastor kept stressing for the longest time I didn't understand. He said that when you love God, when the Bible talks about love, Greek word is like agapao and it, it's specifically used in Greek for love, love for deity okay the God level love alright it doesn't have another meaning in Greek Greek has different verbs for different kinds of love God level love virtue love is what my pastor liked to call it to distinguish it from other love friendship love, sexual love, that kind of thing God level love he kept on saying, you get the same love. You know, Paul says you come to have the love for Christ in Ephesians 3.15 through 19. It's the same kind of love as Christ had. You're living the same kind of life as Christ does when you're in God's system. It's at God's level. So now you're getting to appreciate, which was the point of this audio, the same issues Christ faced. Here he is, the guy who's going to save everybody and nobody likes him. Nobody wants to talk to him. Even the people who were his disciples were constantly misunderstanding him. And that is well known to scholars. They know that the apostles didn't understand. And the scholars don't, don't understand him either. The apostles didn't understand him. They were not comfortable being around him. They believed in him and they stuck to him, but it was, you know, real shallow. And as soon as trouble happened, they all went away. Garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't just Peter who deserted him, they all did. And one of them in particular was John, which he sort of self-confesses at the end of his gospel. It was really shocking. But the point is, is that they're clueless and your, their, their lives depend on you learning and living on Bible and God's system. Christ was down here and every single minute he breathed, he had to think, 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 think. Because sin is a thought. Body just follows through. But most sins are thoughts. And he's got to do all this thought soldiering. For who? People who don't care. People who hated him. People who hated everything he lived for. People who hated his lifestyle. People who didn't bother to know him. You know, hatred is more dismissiveness. And you think something's not important. Oh, studying the Greek and Hebrew is important. Oh, yeah? Those are God's actual words. You don't want to know those words, then you don't want him. I can't tell you how much flack I've gotten from people that, well, I love God and I don't need to read the original Hebrew and Greek. Well, then you don't love God because you have no idea who He is. 
And it's not, you can't just learn it in a day. Well, people resent it when you say things like that. People resented Christ knowing scripture as well as he did. People resented him living the way he did. And most of them just dismissed him. Oh, that's some, yeah, that's some dusty country with some, what is it, Jewish? They call it Jewish prophet walking around talking. So what? People are disinterested in him today. We can't even get right his birthday and death day and we don't even realize that the Bible says there was no star in Bethlehem. We don't care about what's accurate. There's not a Bible movie made that's ever been accurate. Or a Bible documentary for that matter. Nobody cares about the truth in the Bible. But we slap God's name on it and you're there alive to be that way to be so inane and so uncaring and hostile to you, the soldier in the field, they're able to be like that because you're fighting. Why didn't he resent us? Why didn't he say, well, I'm not going to carry the sins of brain out. Why should he carry my sin? What have I ever done for him? Not a thing. You see the point? You're living the same life he lived. If you're learning and living on Bible and God's system, that is the life of Christ. You're living it. And you'll be hated for it to the extent anybody knows. Or, and hatred, like I said, was primarily dismissive. Oh, that's nice. Well, you're a good Christian. That's it. That's dismissiveness. That's hatred. If somebody praises you with this little cute little statement, oh, you must be a good Christian, that means they're trying to buy themselves out of doing what you're doing by complimenting you. That's hatred. Not to mention all the people who think that what you're doing is wacky. That's assuming they even know. So that's the war you fight. And you really are fighting the real war, which is the war for them to stay alive one more day. Just like Christ was fighting here on earth. And on top of that, that's what staves off the world war that's coming, or will influence the way it turns out. So see, the last increment was all about, well, what do you really want out of life? Do you really want to be your own person? And that's a pretty scary thing to deal with because it's a lot of fighting 24-7 the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep. But now it's like, are you willing to still do that when you know that nobody cares? And that they will not do it. They prefer to be childish. And that's why everything's so bad in the first place. Why you have to be fighting. You want to do it anyhow? So what ends up happening is you start to learn. If you say yes, and all you can do is say yes or no. You can feel all, however you want to do about it, but... The feeling doesn't matter. It's the yes and the no that matters. That's when there's real love going on when you say yes. You can say yes and I hate doing it and that's how I feel, I've got to tell you. But you're doing it. That's what real love is. It's not a feeling. It's a positive attitude toward what you don't want. Peace out.